So let me start out by saying that I kind of thought about doing this video last minute after we already got started. Uh, I'm just trying to hit on a few points or tips or I don't know what you want to call them, but things that will make it a little easier if you haven't done this before. Um, I'm kind of all over the place in this video, though. Like I said, I was kind of doing it on the fly. I didn't really put much thought into it. Um, so I'll try and put together a second video on the next log that we mill and do it from the very start to finish what my thought process is and maybe get a video that's a little more refined and not so jumbled up and all over the place. But nonetheless, hopefully this helps somebody, even if just a little bit. All right, so setting this ladder up for the mill. We've had aluminum brackets made and all kinds of different stuff. I can't find them now. And normally we use a regular ladder. This one just got donated today by a special somebody, so it's a lot more rigid than what we were using. But normally, anyways, I had brackets that slid onto the bottom of the rail, but they were always kind of wonky and hard. So we found the easiest way is just to bring a stick of two by four with you. And once you get your ladder level, if you will, on the log, and remember, like, it doesn't matter if it's up or down or if the ladder or your guide on top is left or right, as long as you line it up the same on both ends. So you could be a half a bubble, half a bubble off a level this way. As long as you make it the same on that end, you'll still have a straight cut and you won't have a twist or anything. But So what we do is just basically level the ladder up best we see fit and then come to the end and cut a 2 by 4 to length. Drill your holes. Well, on this one, it's right here. Just drill down through the ladder and into the 2 by 4 and then screw the 2x4 right into the end of the log. The nice thing about doing it this way is you can adjust this thickness. You can rip a board down and keep it thinner across here if you have the meat on the log to do it so that you don't have to have a huge off cut your first cut. And on this end, we did it a little different because we wanted to keep the off cut small. So we actually just went between the rungs drilled a hole through the side here and went in that way so now our off cut is basically going to be as you know as small as we can make it on this end so i just wanted to show you that because we've done it a bunch of different ways and this is kind of what we've landed on and as long as you have you know in the battery world you have a trim saw and a level you can just cut any any thickness of board you need here now it just happened to work out this way, but normally we would put the 2x4 on the bottom of this as well. But this kind of, I guess point being, this is the flexibility of using just your scrap 2x4s to mount your system versus having brackets and stuff that are always a set thickness off the bottom of your ladder, then you'd have a huge offcut. Now, we've kind of found overdoing it. Once you have that offcut, you can always flip it over and mill another slab off of it, but it's nice sometimes to just set it up once and have the smallest off cut you can and i guess what i meant or what i was saying earlier about the level is if say your whole level your whole ladder is like well this isn't a good i'm not very good at this but if your whole if your ladder on one end the log where you wanted it milled was like this as long as you match that on the other side you won't have a twist and then as far as setting up the height if you want like perfect uh, you know grain that's You know quarter sawn in the middle basically if that's what you want And you want a whole bunch of straight grain lines in your middle boards Then you need to measure from the top of your surface where your mill will hang To down to the pith the center of the tree and you need to make that the same on both ends if you want to have grain that is perfectly straight the whole way down. If you just lay it on the log and say it's 
five inches to the pith on that end and 10 inches to the pith center on this end, when you cut it, you'll end up with great big huge cathedral type grain in it, not a whole bunch of straight grain. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but maybe, and sometimes that's probably what people go for, but this one's goofy because we got a funky cut on the end, but normally we'd measure from the top of this to the pith on one end, go down to the other and do the same thing. You set that here and then go down to the other end and make it match. Because if you set this one up here and it's say it's 10 inches and you get down there and it's a foot, you can't make that, that guide system on that end go any lower. So you'd have to start on that end, mount it, and then come down here and raise this one to match. So whatever end you measure the pith on, whatever the shorter end is, you need to go from the tallest one first, how your ladder lays, get that one anchored, and then come down here and lift this end up to match the other one. So hopefully that makes sense. of it that was a 10 minute cut well the fun part will be here in just a second So we took a break mid here, just to let the saw cool down for a minute, but little tips or points to hit on is one, having somebody, that guy, on that end of the mill that knows what RPM your powerhead likes to run at or where it's doing best is key because he's not pushing it so hard at bogs, but he's not letting the thing rev to the moon. So person on that end, I think it's key. You can do it with one person, but it's tough. Two makes it a dream. Uh, the second, I think, is every once in a while taking your wedge or whatever and cleaning out that groove right in front of your mill. It sounds silly, but you get enough stuff built up, it'll actually make the mill ride up. So, I don't, you know, they didn't have it on video, but we usually are trying to keep that clean in front of it. And then keeping the mill going down the log, I guess, if you will, from the side looking across. If you can, jeez, that's a little wobbly. If you can keep it as perpendicular to the log or your slab you're cutting the whole way, the better your slab will come out. If you're constantly doing the like, it, it seems faster and the saw seems like it's running easier I guess if you do the seesaw thing the whole way right like this but you end up with terrible chatter groove marks I think whatever you want to call them I don't know what the proper term is if you can keep your mill perfectly perpendicular the whole way even though it seems a little slower when you get done I mean this it won't show up on camera you know, they look terrible on camera but I mean it's like I mean, you're talking a belt sander and you would be good as far as smoothness goes. I mean, there's, you know, filing's key too, but I mean, there's next to no, I wish I could get it for you. I mean, that's close up. And I mean, there's just, 
there's just not any chatter marks. So filing is key and keeping stuff moving, moving smooth and slow and not seesawing back and forth. Like right there, it looks like, you know, it looks like deep grooves, but I mean, you can't even hardly feel them with your finger tip. I mean, they're there, but not like seriously a belt sander and you're done. So anyways, keeping these things, you know, in the kerf, you know, every six inches or foot to keep the, the slab from biting down behind you is key. And then, like I said, the other things we hit on, keeping the front end of this clean so it's always riding as flat as it can and having the other guy on the other end keeping speed the same and then moving that whole mill, like I said, not seesawing it. I know it seems faster, but it's, it might be faster, but you end up with more work at the end. So if you can keep that as perpendicular as you can the whole way down, you end up with a way smoother slab. It's super awkward to try and describe and film and do everything at once, but as far as on and off goes, a lot of guys will use the ladder on top, but as long as you have this bar, crossbar set up so it's in the middle of the slab, if you will, and you got a guy on that end who's willing to help tip this thing, it really isn't hard. Well, that doesn't make sense. Anyways, basically you can use this bar right here. It's real easy to see whether it's tipped back going on or if it's on it and level like so when you start this doesn't do it justice but anyways use this as your guide and if this is off just make sure that whole part stays level on there the whole way as you're going on and then when you get all the way back to there this rear rail will just go right on because you've kept this here tight to that and you haven't you know this hasn't lifted up and you're not picking that back end up so this I don't know. Seems like common sense stuff, but little things I keep thinking about as we go on here uh, is checking the tightness of this hardware. So like all your clamping points here, the nuts for the height adjustment, you know, these on the rail, they lock washers would be key. We just discussed this. I don't know why we haven't done it yet. But anyways, this stuff all consistently loosens up. Anyways, they loosen up. So having a wrench in your pocket and check those points after each cut is key to keeping it tight. And so on that note, a lot goes into having a smooth cut is, you know, has to do with the chain filing. And we get... I don't know. I think we get cuts consistent with bandsaw blades, to be honest with that you. That right there, that angle, this is a full chisel normal chain that we filed back to five degrees. The top plate is five degrees. I don't know why that won't focus on there. There, that's a little better. Anyway, so instead of being a normal, you know, 25, we filed it back to five. But it is a full chisel chain and the skip tooth at that we've always ran full comp milling chain which is round ground or semi chisel i should say and full comp this is a full chisel skip tooth and i thought it would produce a super you know choppy grainy cut but it doesn't it like i said i mean it looks i can't exp whatever camera won't do it it looks rough as all get out on this, but it's just not. It is so smooth. I mean, smooth, smooth. Like I mentioned earlier, a belt sander for a minute on there and you're done. So spend time up front filing. Spend time putting your spacers in. Spend time making sure everything's perfectly level and square before you start your cut. And it takes time up front, but on the back end, it's exponentially less the work you have to do in flattening a slab and getting it smoothed out. The other thing is, as far as these shims go, we were talking about, oh, of course now I can't get one out, but, so we just buy these, they're for shimming door jams. And I see a lot of guys using like felling wedges and stuff. And we found even with these sometimes, anyways, when as you're going and you want to, 
basically you just want to take up the width of that kerf so that that board or that point or slab whatever you want to call it doesn't set down right so when you put it in just lightly put it in till it stops if this goes all the way in then fine if it doesn't if it gets to here don't shove it in because even just this little tiny shim with pressure off your hand or thumb if it's tight and you shove it in it will actually lift that up and you'll end up getting an uneven slab we ran into that before when we first started doing this we'd shove all these in or we'd use a felling wedge and you'd you know not hammer it in there but you'd push it tight and then give it a little extra well it actually pick the back of that slab up and it'd give you an uneven board or slab so using these little door shims are just they're perfect Right, they're perfect thickness just about for for three eighths chain anyways. Not four oh four but three eighths. They're just about perfect at the backside and they're cheap. It's like two bucks for a pack of, you know, twenty of them or something. And then you put them every foot. But point to that is just put them in till they till you feel resistance. And if they go all the way in, fine, and if they don't, then just stop there and let it be, because if you jam them in, you'll end up lifting that up and you'll get an uneven cut. Oh, you crazy dog. I kind of like it. Ooh, oh, the hose will shut off. There we go. So, for those of you who haven't milled before, uh, FYI, it is not a tidy job. You end up with a little bit of a mess of sawdust. I mean, it's manageable, but it ends up being a lot more than you think. Yeah. Now, it's worth it 100%, but just so you're aware, it's a messy So job. the other key to ending up with super flat slabs in the end, I think, is proper stickering, not just stacking them up. So. We have all these stickered every foot about, okay? And also ratchet straps around it to hold them in log form, or I guess that's what you'd call it, or what I think of it as log form. So anyways, they are completely supported every foot all the way down the length of the slabs. Now, don't get me wrong, that's a lot of stickers, but when you pull them off, there's next to no, you know, nothing's wavy or warped or twisted or anything. They come out, I mean, they are as flat as when you cut them. So, like anything, preparation up front pays dividends on the back end. Just like, you know, everything else. Every foot and they come out absolutely stick straight when you pull them off a pile to use. And I also think that using the ratchet straps are key. We buy these husky ones from Home Depot. And I think a four pack is like under 10 bucks. I mean, you just can't beat it. But it really helps keep everything tight and in shape while they're curing. Oh, oh. So this here is the kind of ladder we normally use, just a standard extension ladder until we got that new recent one that's a little beefier, a little more rigid. One other Anywho. thing, if you don't have a kiln or know somebody that has a kiln, when it comes to drying stuff outside naturally, they say they you know whoever they might be say a year per inch of board thickness for curing outside um so you want to get down to it those right there are three those are three some of those are two and a half that's three those are Two and a half, I think, or three. Anyway, so you're talking, you know, 
two, realistically three years for a lot of this stuff to dry. So I find it's a little bit less than that, but you know, you aren't cutting like this maple. I mean, it fell down a week ago and we're milling it right now. So you aren't using this thing for probably two years with it sitting outside like this curing naturally. Uh, just something to think about. A lot of, you know, we we do a lot of trade milling, you know, come mill the log and leave you four slabs and we take, you know, you take half, we take half type of deal. And a lot of people think that they're going to use it like right away. And they want to know what, you know, how long do I have to wait? And you tell them two or three years and they about choke. But it's the reality of it. If you don't have a kiln, and you don't have, or you don't have an inside heated area to cure it. You know, inside, like a heated garage, say, with a fan blowing on it and maybe a dehumidifier set up. I mean, you cut that down exponentially, but for most people, this is how it's going to dry out here in nature.